So last week, we we're, spoke, we're talking about internet security, that is different example protocols that provide uh, security mechanisms in the internet. And there are different ones available, we're focusing on, on two really. SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, which is what we went through last week. Normally when our applications connect from client to server, they use TCP. With SSL, also called TLS, they're about the same, SSL and TLS. We use TCP, but we encrypt the data to provide security over that connection. So any application that normally uses TCP can also make use of SSL so that the data is encrypted before it's sent across the TCP connection. Encrypted, and we can perform authentication as well. And one of the one of the most common places where SSL is used is in secure web browsing, HTTPS. So HTTPS is simply using normal HTTP, the web browsing protocol, on top of SSL. And we went through an example, we showed a, a Wireshark capture last week. We won't go through that detail again, we'll just summarize the, what we know about HTTPS. When a web server is using or supports HTTPS, then it normally listens on port number 443. A normal non-secure web server listens on port number 80. And the difference is that when we use SSL or HTTPS, we set up a secure connection before you use HTTP. I think we had something like this last week. Normally our client talks to our server using HTTP for web browsing and normally that's on top of TCP. So we create a TCP connection where the server port typically uses port 80 for the server TCP. The client port number is chosen by the operating system and given to the web browser. So that's the normal way to connect across the internet with the web browsing. With HTTPS we use SSL or TLS in between. Why did I write them differently? From the perspective of this course, SSL and TLS are the same. There are some slight differences among the versions, but effectively the same. And the port number used by the server is different. 443 is the default port number. So the server has the same web pages available, but it's set up and I think some of you may remember for your networking lab the, there's a configuration file in Apache web server where you can set up the directories uh, uh, and you can set up different permissions on those directories. You use that configuration file to set up the web server to use SSL as well. So you can say this directory requires a user to use SSL. The server listens on a different port number, 443, and the client, the web browser, creates a normal GET request. GET index.html and some other information. Sends it to SSL, which then uses TCP to create a TCP connection to the server and does the SSL exchange of messages to set up a secure connection. And that's what we went through last week, some of the steps of setting up a, a secure connection with SSL, like this. This is a generic uh, setting up the connection. where We have some hello messages, the server identifies itself, provides a certificate, the client, and they do some key exchange, and then they say let's, let's start encrypting information using this change cipher spec, and then after that, everything that they send between client and server is encrypted. Encrypted and authenticated. So it's encrypted and there's a Mac in there as well. The result is everything that is sent using HTTP, like the GET request and the web page that comes back, is encrypted. So anyone in here who intercepts the messages, so this is my computer, this is some server in the US, anyone in between who intercepts the messages cannot see what the HTTP request or response is. 
So if it contains my bank account information or my username and password to log into the bank, then it will be encrypted and someone who intercepts will not be able to see that information. So that's the basics of where SSL is used in web browsing. And it's also used in other applications. The authentication in HTTPS, there's two forms. First, the client, you, the web browser, want to make sure that you're connecting to the correct server. And similar, the server wants to make sure, in some cases at least, that you are the person who you say you are. So the typical forms of authentication are, is that the server uses a certificate. That is, when we establish this SSL secure connection, the server sends its digital certificate to me, to my web browser. My web browser looks at that certificate that it receives and tries to verify it with the set of certificates of the authorities which, should, which are pre-configured in the web browser. We've seen in one of the earlier, or one of the other topics, that your web browser usually stores a set of certificates of authorities that you trust. So if the server's certificate is signed by one of those authorities, when they send you their certificate, you verify it and you check, yes, this is the correct server. It contains the public key of that correct server. So that's how you check you're communicating with the server that you think you are. Because what could go wrong if we didn't have that is that we send a request to mybank.com and someone intercepts that and sends a response and they're masquerading as my bank when they're in fact some malicious user. So we need some form of authentication so I know that who I'm communicating is my bank and it's not someone pretending to my, be my bank. And that's using certificates. So it assumes that this malicious user cannot get the certificate of the server because this, well, they can get the certificate of the, of the server but they cannot generate it because the certificate contains the domain name. So the certificate identifies www.mybank.com but if this malicious person is using some, some other domain name, myfakebank.com, then this certificate of the server does not, does not match the domain name here. So inside the server certificate, there'll be the actual domain name for that server, mybank.com. So using the certificate is a way to stop the, someone pretending to be the server and therefore you uh, wrongly sending information to them. Of course, often when you contact a server, the server wants to know it's a particular person, especially with your bank. When you contact a bank's web server and you want to access your account information, the bank wants to know it's you that's accessing your, that account. It's not someone pretending to be you. And the way that they do that is not part of SSL. The normal way they do it is using passwords. So the website has some form and in that form the user needs to enter a username and password which has already been registered with the bank when you signed up for an account. They registered your username and password. So you send that username and password in a GET request, some HTTP message to the server, and the server checks that username and password. So that's how the server checks who you are, using normal HTTP uh, username and passwords. And importantly, it's encrypted, because everything we send using HTTP is encrypted between the client and server if we're using SSL. So that's the basics of secure web browsing. And we, we covered the details, the, the message exchange last week, so we won't go into any more details. Any questions on HTTPS or SSL? Maybe when you do your summer training, then you'll get a position where you'll set up web servers and you may have to configure a secure web server. 
So I know some people have done that in summer training at some of the companies last summer. Last summer. So if you're lucky, you'll get something in that area. Last topic, or last uh, protocol in this topic, secure shell. You know secure shell, you've used it uh, in a number of cases. You've probably used it in the networking lab to connect to other computers. You used it probably to set your username and password on the IT server. Secure shell is a protocol for connecting remotely to another computer, or connecting to a remote computer and then performing operations on that computer. In the past, there was a protocol called Telnet. The idea is, we have some computer on the internet, and it may be a shared computer, in that many users have accounts on this. So it's set up so that many users can access this. And Let's say it's a, a, in the old days, same, some mainframe or some fast computer, and people have their terminals, and they want to run some program on this computer from a remote location. So this may be a computer in some office building at work, and here's your computer at home. Your computer at home cannot do what you want it to do. You need to log in to the this server to run some program, perform some operation, access some files. So in the past there was a protocol called Telnet. And Telnet allowed you to supply your username and password, sends it to the server, the server checks your username and password if it matches what's in the database, and once you're authenticated, Everything that you type on this computer is sent to the server and the server executes that. So on the command line, whatever you're typing in the terminal is not executing on your computer, it's executing on that remote computer. So it's as if you're sitting at that remote computer. So that's the, the application that we want to achieve, that we can remotely log into a computer and execute some commands. Telnet was popular but provided no encryption. And two problems. You send your username and password across the internet from your client to the server unencrypted. If someone's in the middle, then they can intercept and see your username and password and then log in as you. The second problem is that even if they do not see your username and password, they can see the commands and the responses coming back. So everything that you send to this computer and everything this computer sends back is unencrypted. So that's the problem with Telnet, and that's where Secure Shell was developed. It was designed to provide the same features as Telnet, but to do it securely. A secure remote login. It also supports some other features like file transfer. So we can copy a file from the server to your client, or even in, in the other, other direction, from client to server, we copy a file. So you have a file on your laptop, you want to put it on the server, then Secure Shell can do that for you in a secure manner in that the login is, in, is authenticated and encrypted and the file is encrypted, so no one can see the file. Tunneling will we'll come to a little bit or at the end. There have been different versions of the Secure Shell protocol. Secure Shell version 2 developed by the Internet Engineering Task Force. Let's have a look at some examples and the details. It uses TCP. So we create a TCP connection and we send our secure shell messages using TCP. There's a protocol for authentication. There's a protocol for setting up the connections and especially doing tunneling. We'll see an example of tunneling shortly. And then the, everything that we send all the messages we send from client to server are sent using what's called the SSH transport layer protocol. So the functionality that are needed, authentication, uh, setting up the connection, 
and, the, and then the encryption of the data uh, separated into different components, different protocols. Similar to we saw with SSL. Even though it's a transport, it's called the SSH transport layer protocol, it doesn't do any of the things that TCP does. So they're both in the transport layer, SSH and TCP. But TCP does things like retransmissions, sets up a connection with the SYN handshake, uh, many other things like flow control and congestion control. So TCP does many things to make the network work uh, reliably and efficiently. SSH doesn't do any of that. Okay? All SSH does, even though it's called the SSH transport layer pro protocol, it's focusing on securing the data that we send across TCP. So they're both transport layer protocols, but they do different things. Let's, what do we look at first? All right, authentication. Let's show an example just to remind everyone what we're talking about. So I'm on my laptop, on a terminal on my laptop. I want to connect and run commands on another computer. So that's what we use SS, SSH for. And the program on my computer is conveniently called SSH. On Windows, the, the application is called what? Anyone used SSH in Windows? Putty. Putty is one program. So there are different applications that implement this protocol. We're talking about the protocol, but there are different applications that implement it, and it depends upon the operating system. So one of them, uh, on my computer, there's a program called SSH, or in fact, Open SSH. On other systems, there are different programs, but they use the same protocol. And the normal f approach is that we run the protocol and specify the address of the server that we want to connect to. So one server I know is the IT server, which says, I want to, why do I do that? All right. Let's just make it a bit bigger. I want to connect from my laptop, the client, to the server, the IT server, and then I want to run commands on the IT server. So here I specify a domain name which maps to an IP address. And normally when we connect, we also connect to a server port number. What port number does my server normally use? Web server normally uses port 80 or port 443 if we're using secure access. What about a secure shell server? Anyone remember? 22. 22. So secure shell servers listen on port number 22. Okay. I do not need to specify that. So this is the client. I specify from the client I want to connect to the IT server. And by default, it says connect to port number 22, because that's the default port. And I press enter, and then it goes, uses the secure shell protocol to set up a connection and do authentication. Note, first it gives me some warning message. And this is about the authentication. How do I know that the server that I'm connecting with is in fact the IT server? It's not someone pretending to be the IT server. So I just initiated a connection to the IT server. It's possible that someone in the middle intercepted that and respond pretending to be the IT server. How do I know that's not happening? And what this warning message is, is uh, I cannot be sure that the computer or the host that you're trying to connect to, this IT.SIT, I cannot be sure who it is. Here's some information that the server has sent. It sent, sent us a fingerprint, which is a signature. The server has sent 
back in response some signature or fingerprint called here. B2, B0, up to 6967. And now it's asking me at the client, are you sure you want to connect to this server? No? Okay, I cannot connect. So now here's some authentication taking place in that the client cannot be sure who the server is. It doesn't know if it's the real server or if it's someone pretending to be the real server. So then it reverts back to the human user to make a decision. Do you really trust this person or this server? And it gives me some information about the, the server, the fingerprint. What can I do to make sure that it is the real server? I need to know the fingerprint of the server. So somehow I need to get information from the server and find its fingerprint. And then when I try to connect, if the server sends me the fingerprint that I know, then I know it's the server. If it sends me a different fingerprint, I know it's someone pretending to be the server. The fingerprint is effectively the public key. It's just the hash of the public key. So what's happening is the server is sending me their public key and my client is saying, do you really trust this public key? Do you know it from before? That's right, so we need to know that this is the public key. Anyone can have it. Do, do we, need, we need to know that it is the server's public key. How do we know that? Well, there's no way to do it here. We need some other way to access the server. I'll show you later the fingerprint. So for now, let's trust it. Let's assume that we know, because we're in the SIT network from here to some server in the other building, that we're confident that there's no one in the middle pretending to be the server. It's possible, but let's assume we trust it. So we say yes, do we want to continue? And now, so I said yes, I trust it, and it adds that information to some configuration file on my computer so that when I log in again, it will not prompt me this question again. It trusts anything that the IT server with this fingerprint. Now ask me for my password. So my username is S. Gordon, and it asks me, well, what's the password for S. Gordon on the IT server? So this, this is the server trying to authenticate the client now. The first part was the client trying to authenticate the server. Now that we trust we are communicating with the right server, the server wants to know that it's the right client, that it's someone who has permission to access. So I need a password that must have been set up in the past. I type in the wrong password. Note the delay here. I type in, press enter. Why does it take so long to respond here? I pressed enter and then there's a delay. It's adding some security. How? You can keep putting in password for the password. Yeah, this is, it's, the server is manually, manually slowing down so that I cannot continuously try many passwords. You see the, the delay, in fact, I think we've run out of opportunities. A delay of several seconds, which means I can only make one attempt for a password several seconds. So if I want to brute force or guess a password, then with this delay, it's going to take me a very long time if I try many passwords. So this is a password uh, uh, security mechanism of this delay. It doesn't take long to respond. It's just this introduction of an extra delay to slow down attempts on the password. I tried too many passwords, so here's another way. The server says, OK, you've tried too many passwords, permission denied. I can get around that by just trying again. And coming back to passwords before I enter, the server can also log these password attempts, which is another password security mechanism. If the server knows who is making attempts, from what IP address they're making attempts, then they can potentially later track them 
and maybe in the future block them from making attempts uh, if they're entering the wrong password. But let's try to log in. And I entered in the correct password then. It gives me some warning message about SIT internet access. And now, although it doesn't look much different, I am actually executing commands on the remote server. Everything that I type in is now running on the IT server, not on my laptop. Uh, I can see, although it's not, it doesn't display very well when we're zoomed in, but I can see the IP address for this server, 192.168.122.10. I can see every uh, list of files on this <laughs> server. Uh, so I can see some files on the server. So this is the remote login application working. Everything I type now is running on another computer. If I run a program, it's on that other computer. That's what we intend. And importantly, with SSH, when I type something in, when I hit the letters L and S, those letters are sent to the server. LS is sent to the server using SSH. The server executes them when I press enter. So when I press enter, the server executes ls. The server produces some output and sends that output, which is this, back to the client and my client shows it on my screen. So everything that I type in and everything that comes back is encrypted. So again, this person in the middle cannot see what's being sent and received in this case when we're using SSH. So that's the idea of SSH. Uh, while we're here, so the authentication of the client was done using username and password. You can also, there's alternatives for authenticating the client, you can authenticate using a, a public and private key. So there are other ways to authenticate the client. Authentication of the server was done by the server sending information to the client, the public key and a signature of that. And it prompted us. It didn't, we weren't sure the way we trust it or not. And it gave us some fingerprint. In fact, on the server, there is a public key stored. And we can see that if you manage or if you're the root user for the server you can see the public and private key for the server in this case and they're in these files there are different algorithms used we know one algorithm for public key encryption is RSA so there's an RSA private key and public key but there are other algorithms there's DSA the digital signature algorithm so there's a DSA key and public, private and public key, and a variant of DSA using elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography, EC DSA. So different algorithms for public key cryptography. These are the server keys. Just to check, so now I'm accessing the server. Uh, if we trust this server, we can check just quickly the signature. If I've got it correct, I hope. No. What I've done is, and it's not important the command, but I've just listed the signature of the server's public key. The value is this B2, B0, all through to 69667. That is the signature of the server's public key. So, now when you log into the server, if you know this signature and you log into the server and it gives you this warning, here's the signature of the server, do you trust it? Then a way for you to be sure that you trust it is to compare it to this known value. 
If it's the same, then you're actually logging into the IT server. If it's a different value, then maybe it's someone pretending to be the IT server. So the real way to authenticate the server is in advance, you need to know this value. So if I knew this value in advance, you remember the first four, B2, B0, 6, 9, 6, 7. If we exit, I'm back on my laptop. Uh, and try and log in again. See, when it prompts me, do you really trust the server? It presents the fingerprint of the server, B2, B0, all along 6967. If that matches the, finger, the actual fingerprint of the server that we saw before, then we trust it. And I think if you can check, you cannot check, you cannot see the other one, but you could check and see if they're the same. So if you see this warning, it's because your client cannot determine if you trust the server or not. It's up to the human user to, to make uh, some connection there. And in this case, it's not using RSA for public-private keys. It's using elliptic curve cryptography with DSA, just a variant, a different algorithm. OK. So. SSH authentication. To authenticate the server, the server has a public and private key. When we try to log into the server, it, we assume that a client knows the server's public key. Well, if we don't know the public key, if we don't have it on the client, then the client presents the warning like we saw. And then it's up to the human user to, to determine whether we trust it. So. To avoid such a warning, what I could do is configure my computer to have the public key of the server. If that was set up, then when I log in, there would be no such warning. It's automatically trusted. Authenticating the client, password-based. The user provides a username and password. There's also an alternative, which is key-based, where the client has its own public-private key pair. And that's set up and configured at the server so that you can log in without a password. So there are different ways to authenticate the client. This is a generic, uh, or a diagram showing a generic packet exchange with SSH. We have a client and server, we establish a TCP connection, and we'll see this in Wireshark. So we'll just quickly go through. We tell each other about the algorithms we support and who we actually we tell each other about what protocol we support what version of the protocol to make sure we're using the right version maybe an old version is found to be insecure version 1.8 is has a bug in it don't trust it so that's why the client and server indicate what version they're using to make sure that they're using a version that they both agree is secure then they exchange information about the algorithms they want to use. So say, I want to use this signature algorithm, this encryption algorithm, this MAC algorithm. So we'll see that. And this key exchange algorithm. So they select a set of algorithms. They perform a key exchange. We need to encrypt our information. To encrypt, we're going to use symmetric key cryptography and we need a secret key. So how do I get a secret key at both the client and server? We need a key exchange algorithm. We'll see the one that we use normally is Diffie-Hellman. We use Diffie-Hellman to exchange a secret. Once we exchange a secret, so both sides know some secret, then we send some special message to generate new keys. We can think the secret is a master key. We generate a session key. And then we, uh, I think this is an optional message, eventually after this we start sending encrypted data back and forth. Let's look in Wireshark to see that. So this is a capture of me logging into another computer. 
In that case, it was the ICT server that I logged into. So my IP address is 192.168.1.5. That's the client. The server is 203.131.209.8. Or maybe it's yeah, I think dot eighty two dot eighty two. That's the server. So the first three messages, these are just the TCP connection. Sin, Synac. Uh, this is a repeat. This is a retransmission, and eventually we get an ACK here. So we have Sin, Synac, but something went wrong in that the message didn't get through. There was a retransmission here and here and then finally an ACK comes back. So that's just TCP connection set up between client and server. Then SSH starts. We'll see some of the messages. First, the server sends some identification information to the client. That's this message. Note that the Source port number is 22. It's coming from the server to the client, this message. The server is this 203 IP address. The client is 192.168 IP address. What does this message contain? Very simple. Just a string that identifies the version and of SSH being used. SSH version 2.0. The implementation is open SSH 4.7, Debian, Ubuntu, and so on. So just something to identify the exact version of software and protocol being used. Yeah? This is the server sending first, so it's the server. Yep. In, in this case, the server sends this message. And next SSH message, client sends a response. And the client. 192.168.1.5 sending to the server sends what protocol it's using. And assuming they both are happy to use that, that version, they continue. So that was easy. The next step is the client sends information to the server saying what algorithms it supports. So if we expand that message, Sorry, here we go. Yep. A list of algorithms. There are algorithms for different operations. There are what have we got? Key exchange algorithms. So we have key exchange. We need algorithms for encryption. And in fact, we can have algorithms for encrypting each direction to be different. Algorithms for encryption from client to server and from server to client. client to server and server to client. So when the client sends something to the server, it can encrypt using AES, for example, and the server sends something back to the client, they can encrypt with triple deaths. They can choose different algorithms. And what this message shows is the set of algorithms supported by the client. For key exchange, Diffie-Hellman group key exchange or group exchange SHA-256 and it has a list of algorithms given in order of preference. Diffie-Hellman group exchange SHA-1, Diffie-Hellman group 14, SHA-1, four different algorithms. All based upon Diffie-Hellman, just variations. So they are the algorithms supported by the client and similar for encryption. AES-128 with counter mode, AES192 with counter mode, 256 with counter mode, ARC4, which is another symmetric key algorithm, and so on. So these are the algorithms that the client supports. 
starting with the first preference, second preference, and so on. And other algorithms we have. MAC algorithms. For authentication of the data, we use a MAC. The same in SSL. We take the data and calculate a, a short MAC, a message authentication code, based on the data and some input key. So what algorithm for the MAC? And again, it can be different in either direction. HMAC, MD5, HMAC, SHA1, and some others. Remember, a MAC and a hash can do similar things, except a MAC takes a key as an input. A hash does not. Hash applies just on the data. A MAC applies on the data and with a key as well. HMAC turns a hash like MD5 into a MAC. MD5 is a hash function that takes just data as input. HMAC takes MD5 and turns it into a MAC function so that it takes both data and a key as input. So that's common use for a MAC function, to use MD5 or SHA1 with HMAC. And the last thing is not about encryption, but compression. You can also compress the data. And none, that's the, the pr preferred compression, no compression. Uh, Zlib is another algorithm or library of, for compression. Client tells the server what it supports. Next message, server sends back a response saying what it supports. And it's similar, OK? different set of algorithms, what the server supports and prefers, and they choose the first matching one that the server supports. So the first one that's common that is the highest in the list. So this is used to choose the four out or the, the set of algorithms for key exchange, encryption, MAC, and client to server. Server to client and also compression. Once we do that, we do the key exchange. Because we're going to encrypt our data with a symmetric key algorithm, we need a secret key. Both sides need to know it. So we use a key exchange algorithm to agree upon a secret key. And they use Diffie-Hellman. Just scroll down. So now the next message, the client sends a message to the server, something about using Diffie Hellman. Remember with Diffie Hellman, we choose some value, uh, we calculate a public value and send it to the other side. The other side does the same, and from those values, we can calculate a shared secret key. It's in your slides where this is Diffie-Hellman so this is from uh, an earlier topic where user A chooses XA where we start with a public value alpha and Q and calculate YA send that to B B does the same sends back YB and then they both calculate K and they both get the same value of K and that's their shared secret that's what we'll see in the capture. It's just that in the capture, instead of using alpha, q, y, a, x, a, and so on, they use different letters for the variables. And the mapping and the notation used in SSH is shown here. Instead of q, they use p. I'll show you in a moment. Instead of alpha, there's g. Instead of y, a, it's e. And y, b is f. So we're looking for P, G, E, and F. Sorry. This is from the, from the client to the server. And it contains none of those values. It's saying something about what, uh, what public values should we use, or what set of public values should we use. It's talking about the length in the number of bits of the public value. 
of Q. Remember, we have two public values, alpha and Q. Alpha need to be a primitive root of Q. So what is the value of Q? The client says it should be within some size in terms of number of bits. This is in hexadecimal. What's that? 4 times 256. It needs to be between 1,000 and 24 bits. And what's 2,000 in hexadecimal? I think maybe 8,000 bits. Or you'll work it out if it's not 8,000 bits. But this is the length of G that needs to be chosen between greater than 1,024 bits and less than some value. That's the length. It's not the value of G, it's just the required length. Did I say G? Q in the old terms. P in SSH notation. Here it is, the modulus. The server chooses it. So we have alpha, Q, YA, and YB. Alpha, the notation here is G. The value is 5. Q is a large number, the modulus, because we mod by Q. The notation is P in SSH, and here's the value. It's larger than 1,024 bits. It was chosen by the server. So we can see the value of P here. So they're the public values. Anyone can see these. Our user in the middle who intercepts these messages can of course see them, because I've captured, I can see them. So we can see these values. What's next? Sorry. Where were we? So here we have alpha and Q, or alpha and Q, G and P in SSH notation. And then the next message, the client sends back its public value called E here. So the client uses the Diffie Hellman equation to calculate its public value. It chooses a private value, xa, and calculates ya, or e, from xa and the public values and gets this long value. Sends it to the server, and the server does the same. The server calculates its private value and then calculates a public value, YB, called F in this case, and sends it back. As a result, both sides know each other's public value and then can easily calculate K, the secret. So they both know the secret. And now they use that secret to, perform, to do the encryption. But in fact, they don't use the, that secret, they generate another secret from that initial secret. So the result of this, that they get some secret, let's say KS, both sides know it, because that's what Diffie-Hellman does, both sides know KS as a result. Then they use KS to generate, let's think of this as a master key, they use it to generate a session key, and then they'll encrypt with that session key. How do they generate the session key? There's an algorithm or some algorithms that uh, are standard in SSH for doing that. We will not go into the details of how that works. It's, it's on one of our slides, but too much detail. So the idea is that once you have a secret key, you generate a session key using some other inputs, some session ID, some string, some hash value, and you hash that all together, and you get another key. So this is a way to generate a session key. But we don't need to know how that happens.
the server also sends back a signature that they'll use in that generation of the, the session key. Next message is essentially saying, let's use these session keys to encrypt the data. New keys. We've just generated KS. We've just generated a session key each. They should be the same because we start with the same KS. And this message just says, let's start sending our data encrypted with this key we generated. Let's use the new keys. So the next message is encrypted. We don't see what's the contents. We see some ciphertext. We see the ciphertext and a MAC, where the MAC is calculated based upon the data and some secret key. And all the messages from then on are encrypted. We can just see the ciphertext, and therefore we cannot find out what those messages were. So when I log in now, somewhere in these encrypted packets was my username and password. It was the plain text. It was encrypted and sent from client to server. But of course, anyone who captures this and intercepts will not see that information. And that's the basics of SSH. We tell each other what protocol we're using. We tell each other what algorithms we support select an algorithm, we generate a, or we perform a key exchange so that we generate a secret key which is shared amongst the two entities and then we start encrypting our data using the encryption algorithm we chose and using the MAC functions we chose and optionally using compression. protocol version, algorithms, perform a key exchange, tell each other let's use the new keys that we just generated and from then on we will see the encrypted data. No plain text is sent or no plain text can be seen by someone in the middle. So that's the basics of SSH. So we have authentication using keys by the server, usually using a username and some passwords, but we can optionally use keys for the client authentication as well. And we go through this uh, initial exchange of packets to agree upon algorithms, generate a key, and then encrypt. This is too much detail for, for that. This is just some of the algorithms supported. Okay? So defining the, what all these strings mean. AES we see in there and, and other algorithms that we may, may not have heard of. We just saw the Wireshark capture. And that's the basics of SSH. We've got one more thing to demonstrate. It won't take long. Any questions on SSH? The last thing will be about tunneling. But before we do that, everyone can secure a shell into another computer. In an exam next week, given some diagram about how SSH works, you should be able to answer some questions about what's happening. Of course, you don't need to remember the, the detailed packets. You don't need to remember this, how this works, but given this, or given some capture, or given some information about what's happening, you should be able to answer some questions about what algorithm was used, what was the purpose of a particular set of steps, uh, how was the authentication performed, how do you prevent such attacks. So you don't need to remember the details, but you need to know how it works if you're given those details. Secure Shell lets us to log into another computer and run commands on that computer. It can also be used for other things. Oh, we didn't say this is about how we 
encrypt the packet. The payload is the plain text, the message we want to send. We compress. We may add some padding to make it a right, the right size for encryption. Add some header, some sequence number. Encrypt, calculate a MAC, send the ciphertext and the MAC. So we saw in the capture there was ciphertext and some MAC value. That's the packet that's sent. Last, last topic. What is my IP address? Just refresh. My IP address. So here's my web browser on the laptop. And I've just visited a website called What is My IP? And that website, what the server does, is that it records, so the server receives a packet from the web browser. Inside that packet is the source IP address. This website simply displays the source, web, the source IP address on the page. So from the server's perspective, the client that contacted it was 203.131.209.66. So that's a way to find out a client's IP address. Well, it's not so simple because the way that it works and in many networks is that all of the computers inside SIT, including my laptop, go through a special device in SIT and from the outside network's perspective, from the public internet, it looks like they all come from the one IP address, this 203.131.209.66 address. It's called network address translation uh, and the uh, it can be combined with a firewall and some security mechanisms and in this case even a proxy. But for now this this website has identified my client as this 203.131.209.66 and found the corresponding domain name for this proxy of proxy.sit. So this website knows that I'm in SIT okay? and they know I'm in Thailand so the they know at least my location uh, and in fact you can find uh, more accurate the location based upon an IP address. Let's try something different. We can use SSH to create a tunnel and in, in different ways. One way is that and that's what we'll show is that when I send data out it goes through the SIT proxy and then out to the, the web server. What I'm going to use is create a tunnel where the data goes from my computer. Using SSH, I'll send it to some intermediate server, and that intermediate server will send it to the web server. What we'll do is create a tunnel to this intermediate server. Was this encrypted this information? Anyone? So the first case my browser using some port number I don't know what it was, let's make it up contacted the server port 80 and the server was in this case what is my IP? And the browser, of course, is inside SIT. And the server identified my IP address and it knows where I am. Not encrypted. There's no HTTPS. It doesn't show uh, in the browser what's used, but you'll see an icon in there that something it's encrypted if HTTPS was used. So what I sent from my computer to this web server, let's say in the US, was sent in the clear. Let's try a different approach where we're going to send from my browser to the same web server but via some intermediate server. And what we'll do, what I'll do is 
redirect what my browser sends to SSH and connect using SSH to this intermediate server. And this part from my computer to this intermediate server is called a tunnel. What we're going to do is send our web traffic, which is normally sent using TCP, but send it to an intermediate server using SSH. So it will be encrypted over this portion of the internet from my computer to the intermediate server. And then we'll see the end result from the, the final web server. So what I'm going to do, I need to do two things. I need to set up a secure connection from, a secure shell connection from my computer to this intermediate server. So I need an intermediate server. Turns out I have one. My own web server or my own uh, server, I can create a sec secure shell connection to it. And I'm going to choose a port to listen on. It's a special case of secure shell. So the intermediate server is sandylands.info, that's this middle one. What I'm going to do is this minus nd5555, I just chose that as a port number, is going to tell SSH on my computer, because this is running on my computer, my laptop, to listen on this port number. SSH is going to listen like it's a server. Anything that it receives on port 5555, it will send to sandylands.info. So whatever it receives here will be sent securely to the server here, which listens on port 22. And then this server, this SSH server, will take it and send it out across the internet, unencrypted. So whatever comes into SSH is then going to be encrypted and sent using secure shell to sandylands.info. And whatever that receives, it will take the the original input and send it across the internet. Except it will set the source address to be sandylands.info. When my, in the first case, when my browser sent a packet, my computer sent a packet, the destination was the web server. What is my IP? The source was my, whatever it was, 203 address, whatever was shown on the website. When we use the SSH tunneling, I'm going to send it securely to this intermediate server, and then the source address will be that of the intermediate server, which turns out to be 106 dot something. We'll see in a moment. The idea here is that we're now providing some level of security, at least for this portion of the network, from my computer to this intermediate server. And we'll see, we'll discuss the, the impact of that in a moment after we do it. So I tell my, I tell to my computer to create a secure shell connection to an intermediate server, listen on port 5555, yes, I trust it. Provide the password. And it does nothing, it just sits there and waits. Whatever an application sends to port 5555 will be sent across this secure connection. Which applications send to port 5555? Anyone know? Which applications send to port 80? Which app, or uh, simpler, which applications? Web browser sends to port 80. Which applications send to port 22? SSH. SSH applications. Which applications send to 5555? No idea. OK. <laughs> We're going to tell our web browser to send to this port. Most web browsers have an option. 
I'm going to set up my web browser in the preferences to say, in my connection, use a proxy. Instead of sending everything from my web browser direct to the internet, port 80, on some server, send it to some intermediate address. And I've set it up. The protocol or the, the technique for using this is called SOX. But it's a local proxy and I've specified the port 5555. What that means when I set this, whenever my web browser wants to send a message, it doesn't send it out to the internet, it sends it to port 5555, which is my secure shell program listening to receive information. We set that up. I've specified the port already here. I just chose a port that was unused or that was not common. And now let's refresh the web page. Let's hope it works. OK. Now from what I just did, I refreshed, refreshed the web page. My browser created a request. It's sent to this proxy port, this 5555 port, which is in fact my local secure shell client, which then takes that, encrypts it, sends it across the internet to sandylands.info, takes what it receives, and then sends that, the web request, in a packet to the real server. The real server receives it, and the real web server detects my IP address to be 106.187.46.22 which is in fact the IP address for sandylands.info. Another example, you visit Google and which country does it normally take you to? Which country do you think it should be? Google, just Google dot com I mean Japan okay because the server this intermediate server is in fact in Japan so from Google's web service perspective it's received a request from a computer that it identifies as being in Japan and therefore it sends back the Japanese Google web page to my computer so, this is one example of using SSH for tunneling. What we've done is created a tunnel from my computer to some intermediate server and then access the rest of the internet via that intermediate server. Well, I wouldn't, I know, I always know my own IP address. No, there's no way for Google or this server to know this one's IP address because they receive an IP packet where the source address is this computer. It's acting as a proxy in that it's sending on behalf of me. And as a result, we've got some form of hiding our communications. The end server that we're communicating with now doesn't know exactly where we are. They think I'm in Japan, but I'm here in Thailand. Okay, so that's some form of security in that it's hiding the location of the user. Normally the location could be termed, determined based on the IP address. The other form of security, we've encrypted the data going between my laptop and my intermediate server. Not across from my intermediate server to the end server, that's unencrypted. Let's say I don't trust someone inside SIT, okay? Normally when I send something within SIT, it goes from my laptop unencrypted through SIT's network and then out onto the internet. But let's say someone is listening into my communications inside SIT, so I don't trust someone inside this room, for example. So my computer encrypts that information, sends it through SIT's network to some outside server, but it's encrypted. Anyone who intercepts this cannot see 
what the content of that message is. So again, we've got some form of confidentiality just across this portion of the network. So that's an example of using SSH for this purpose of tunneling traffic via an intermediate server. There are other ways to do tunneling, but that's the only example I wanted to introduce. So it's a common way, tunneling is a common way to connect to another network and to pretend as if you're somewhere else or someone else. From the server end service perspective, it's receiving data from this intermediate server, where in fact the, so the original source is my computer. Any questions on that? Quite quick to go through that demo. You can try it yourself, but you need an intermediate server to do it in this case. Don't worry, there won't be an exam question on that. There won't be an exam question on tunneling. And generically, the tunneling is like this, where normally our application uses TCP directly. That's in the top part. With SSH, we can redirect our application traffic via SSH. There's what's called local forwarding and remote forwarding. In my case, I did remote forwarding. There's an alternative where we can do local forwarding. And it's a way, for example, to bypass firewalls. If a firewall, and it would be strange, but if a firewall blocked port 80, so you couldn't browse the web, but allowed port 22, so you could send with SSH, then you could use a SSH tunnel to somewhere outside and then access the web from there. So it's a way to uh, bypass different blocks from a firewall. Yes? Yes, uh, there's a proxy. In fact, you can think there's two proxies. This is ac acting as a proxy for my browser. It's intercepting. And you can think, yes, this is a proxy for my connection from here to here. Someone acting on the behalf of some original source. You can get, there are free web proxies available on the internet which do a similar thing. But usually, so they are some intermediate server that you can send your traffic via, which then send on to the final destination. In this case, our proxy is using SSH, but a proxy doesn't have to use SSH. A proxy has different functionality. In this case, we're, we're using SSH, yes. Uh, does uh, Windows Remote Desktop Connection use any security? Can someone answer that? Does Windows Remote Des Desktop Connection use any secure connection? I don't know. I, I think with Windows, I don't use Windows, so. Uh, I, so I, I honestly don't know. I think that in the past, there, um, the VNC, for example, is a generic protocol for securing connection, uh, remote desktops. And yes, that uses encryption. Um, most likely, there's a, at least an option for Windows to use it. Most likely, it does by default in the latest versions of Windows. But you'd have to check that to be sure. Okay. Finished. Finish the course.